Good morning. I'd just like to say it's a bounty to be here with you this morning, and I'm going to make a confession too. This is my first time attending an, a, com a conference here, and also uh, it's my first time speaking to an audience of such magnitude. So, um, but, but where else should I get my feet wet but with my family, right? All right, so, okay. I am going to actually engage you in conversation, dialogue, small group, as best we can do this, as I share with you the program that my company has implemented throughout St. Louis, Missouri, and surrounding states. And actually, we've been here in California. We... Um, worked in Santa Barbara, San Diego, and Los Angeles. We haven't been here for a while because school systems can no longer afford to bring people in, but we were, I think, an integral force in helping to restructure and to have teachers reevaluate how they look at young people, particularly children of color. And so with that, I am going to engage you in, as soon as we get the screen up, and what is it that I am doing in my non-technological, so there should be a screen up here. And we, we went through this several times, didn't we? So that we would have it. But wouldn't you know it? Okay, okay, all right, so let me. Okay, and we check and double check. I did. And it's not up. So where's my most trusted friend? What did Okay. Okay, so. The mouse. The mouse. Yay, okay, <laughs> thank you. Transforming Habits of Thought, I Do Belong Here. This is one of the programs that we have implemented and we call it our Ubuntu program. Of course, I want you to know and probably what you have surmised that everything that I do is based on my being a Baha'i. So as much as I can, I infuse the Baha'i principles into any of the work that I do. The other three members of my company are well aware of my being a Baha'i and they are on board with everything that we can do in order for us to create an environment where young people feel valued, where the young ones know that they're noble, and for particularly um, a group of young people, and these are the children of color, it has been a struggle for them to actually see themselves as these noble beings. So a lot of potential and capacity is, has been wasted because of the fact that these individuals don't have a mirror that is held up to them to let them know who they truly are, their authentic self their spiritual self. And so what we do as we work with teachers, and those are the, the primary people with whom we work, teachers and administrators and school systems, we create an environment where they can come together and to explore issues of race, class, and sexism. And when we do this, or as we do this, we create norms that young people the teachers, the administrators can adhere to. Because to talk about race can be emotionally volatile. And so what we do is to set the norms that you see there in front of you. And they come from a person by the name of Margaret Wheatley, who has written several books. One is Leadership and the New Science. And what she says about how we can come together to, cre to create this inclusive environment 
is that we have to acknowledge one another as equals. We try to stay curious about each other. We recognize that we need each other's help to become better listeners, and that thread of communication has been woven into many of the, the talks that you've already heard, that in order to communicate, we certainly are going to share what it is that we need to share, but we also have to be able to listen. We slow down so that we have time to think and reflect, and that's something that teachers don't really have an opportunity to do, but we create that space for them to be able to think and to reflect. And we remember that conversation is the natural way humans think together. We tell stories, and we have found that when we have an opportunity to share our stories, then we're able to hear others' experiences, we're able to dispel some of the mental models and the predispositions that we have about other people because we have the opportunity to come together and to listen. And finally, we share with them that it's going to get messy. Anytime you talk about race or racism, we know that it's going to get messy. But the metaphor that we use for that is if you plant a seed and you have the camera, that infrared camera that's able to look at how the seed germinates and you can see the roots struggling and it looks as if they're in agony, but soon we know that that seed will pop up and there will be a plant. And so we say that if they were to keep that analogy that yes, it is going to get messy, it, we, you, you may struggle, but eventually that seed or that plant will pop up and that plant will be that which will say to young people that there is an environment that we can deliberately and intentionally create for you as educators that will honor you, will acknowledge your nobility. Racism, one of the most baneful and persistent evils, is a major barrier to peace. Its practice perpetrates too outrageous a violation of the dignity of human beings to be countenanced under any pretext. Racism retards the unfoldment of the boundless potentialities of its victims, corrupts its perpetrators, and blights human progress. The additional part of that quote is recognition of the oneness of mankind implemented by appropriate legal measures must be universally upheld if this problem is to be overcome. As an educator of 38 years, I have witnessed how racism has retarded the potentialities and limited the ability for young people to access all of their brilliance. What I am going to in the next 40 minutes is to engage you as much as possible in a brief workshop that we do with teachers and administrators. And to the degree that you engage in it, hopefully you will see exactly what can happen when people have an opportunity to listen to one another. So your very first participatory activity is that I want you to take a few minutes and I want you to think about the many gifts that you have. Now mind you, I'm not talking about bragging because sometimes we, we get into that place where people say, well, Billy, if you tell me to think about my gifts, are you asking me to go to that egoic mind? And no, I'm not. I am asking you to just think about what you do and to give yourself credit for what you do and how you show up. So for the next minute or so, just think about the gifts that you bring, get those up in your mind, and then I'm gonna ask you to share those gifts in a very special way. Now remember, you are workshop participants, so if that helps also to, to set the framework for you, that you are actually engaged in the type of workshop that we would conduct. We're doing it in 50 minutes. We actually do it in two days with uh, six days of follow-up. So we're gonna move rapidly here. All right, so 
How are you going to share these gifts? Well, you're going to turn to the person that you are seated next to. And you are going to share in a very particular listening configuration. We call it a listening pair or paired sharing. What you are going to do, what I'm inviting you, inviting you to do is to, as a listener, just listen to the person share his or her gifts. You aren't going to ask any questions. You aren't going to in any way say, but let me tell you about my gifts, okay? Because <laughs> you will have an opportunity to do that as well when I tell you to switch. But right now, your sole purpose of listening to that person is to create this invitational and I dare say spiritual space where that person feels totally comfort comfortable, uh, is feeling not judged in any way, uh, is feeling for that particular moment as if he or she is a sunshine in your life. All right, so can you get a feel for that? Now this is what we invite the teachers to do from the very beginning because we are setting the framework for us to actually delve into some deeper issues. But our first activity is to really celebrate the goodness about who the people are who come to us. No matter what their belief system is, we believe in that innate goodness and the course as a Baha'i, you know I, I believe that and it undergirds everything that I do. But those who come in sometimes haven't even thought about their goodness. So this is an opportunity for them to do that. And I'm going to invite you to. I know you know about your goodness, but just let's reinforce it. So you are going to share with the person who's sitting next to you all of the good things about who you are. Okay? All right, you got to do it now. You, uh, I didn't get your, uh, your verbal or your hand participation that you were going to go along with me, but I'm assuming since you're my family that you're going to participate in this. So turn to the person that you are seated next to. I forgot to give you some additional directions. I should have said to you that your statements have to be robust. All right, robust as opposed to thin. Now let me give you an example of a thin statement. A thin statement might be shared in this manner, um, really, I love to read books, and um, people like to hear me talk about them. Baha'i books, so we'll put that in there. All right. Now, let's robusticize that statement. Okay. And to robusticize it, it would be, Billy, I like to read books, and when people listen to me, they sit at my feet in awe. <laughs> right. All right. You can... You can tell her it down if you want, but I would say go for that. So this, this means you cannot say, I think I'm a good whatever it is, or uh, people tell me that I'm a good whatever it is. You are claiming it. You are claiming it, and that's exactly what I want from you. So put aside the stuff about bragging. You're not bragging. You are validating who you are. All right, now, one person is talking, the other person is listening, and then I'll say switch, and the person who's doing the listening will be the person who will do the talking. Got it? All right, begin. All right. Finish your thought. Complete your statement and time. Finish your thought, complete your statement, and now you are switching. Listeners, you are now the speakers, so begin. Finish your thought, complete your statement, and time. Finish your thought, complete your statement, and 
and time. Oh, this is wonderful. See how eager you are to talk and to listen and to share good things about you. Yeah. So finish your thought and complete your statement and time. Okay, I'm gonna go into my teacher mode. If you hear my voice, clap once. If you hear my voice, clap twice. Thank you, thank you. That's the um, eighth grade teacher coming out there. All right. I want you to, in just a little bit of silence now, to think about what you heard and what you said. And above all, notice the feelings. Notice what feelings are coming up. As we do this work, we focus a lot on feelings because they are there. We know that feelings are not the most accurate barometer of our thinking. We acknowledge that, but we also know that if we can't get to the feelings, sometimes this rich, flexible intelligence is retarded. We can't get to it because we're using so much energy supporting the feelings. About the time that we started our work, there was an educator by the name of Julian Weisclass, who actually lives in Santa Barbara, California, who had an article that was produced or included in a, a book called Ed Week, a magazine actually. And Julian said, any reform effort designed to reduce the achievement gap that does not help, help whites and people of color heal from the hurts of racism will not likely succeed over time. Although educators cannot by themselves solve all of the problems caused by racism in society, and we know that, you know, we're presupposing that we know it is the faith that will do that. It is possible for us to construct healing communities in which people can learn how to listen and give attention while others heal. And that's exactly what you did. That's how we start our workshops so that people get in the practice of transforming habits of thought about how they really listen to one another. That there is a way that you can listen very deeply, that you connect with that person's spirit. Ubuntu is the title that we have given to this particular program. And I don't want to reduce uh, the Ubuntu cosmology to just uh, a greeting, but we, as people come in and they are engaged in the program, we ask them to say Ubuntu to one another. And then we proceed to explain that it is truly a, com a cosmology, that it says, I belong, therefore I am. Four hundred years ago, Rene Descartes talked about, um, in a way, separation of mind and spirit. It was an either-or way of looking at life. It was very logical. He focused on the individual, and he focused also on contracts. That, and there's nothing wrong with that. I do something for you, you do something for me. Ubuntu, however, complements what Rene Descartes talked about. And Ubuntu says it is both and. That we allow intuition to flourish, that we build and uh, we focus on community and what it means for one another, and that we make covenants among ourselves. And we do all of this in a way that we set the environment where young people not only are going to be exposed to the academic portion, the cognitive uh, information, that is true, 
because we are in, we live in a society, particularly in the school district, where they are measured. I don't know if I have any educators out there, but if I say AYP, that means average yearly progress. And schools are given money on how well their students do. So there's a real focus on the cognitive domain. But we also know that if young people are going to thrive, they must also have individuals who will focus on the affective domain. That until young people feel as if they belong, they're not going to do what it is that will allow them to thrive. If they see you as a teacher who is focused, or an educator, who is focused on test scores and not on the human spirit, then young people rebel. They detach, they move into sometimes antisocial behavior, and they are extremely perceptive. We have found that if you say one thing to them and you, you give them the impression that you are supportive of them, but your covert behavior says, I don't really respect you or I don't see you capable of achieving what it is that I put out there. If teachers don't hold up for young people high expectations, then what is it that you suppose they do? They move to those lower expectations that teachers have of them. And when they do that, they also know that if you don't respect them, then there is no way in the world that you care about them. And we know the highest correlate between teachers or the highest correlate of success for students is the relationship between them and teachers. So it is the relation piece that we do a lot of work with and we focus on. Ubuntu says, Ubuntu does not say, I think therefore I am. It says rather I am human because I belong, I participate, and I share. And we had the saying long before Avatar. <laughs> when we say, I see you, the response is, I am seen. Let's talk a little bit about belonging. Adler in 1939 said that failure in school stems from feeling unconnected. Belonging equals enhanced sense of worth and increased self-confidence in contrast to lacking a feeling of belonging equals felt helplessness and no sense of control over their environment. Students who are labeled as disadvantaged students tend to be socialized for subordination. Advantaged students are socialized for responsibility. And that's a critical difference. Okay. Students who are failing seek their own sense of belongingness in a context that is often more antisocial. And what happens, just a little bit of information here, from the Chicago area alone, the number of students or a number of young people, and I'm going to um, really focus on the fact that the young people that I'm speaking of are, for the most part, African-American males and Latino males. They seek a sense of belonging in a way that will involve them in gangs or any other kind of antisocial behavior that often will see them in prison. And in just from 1985 to 2005, you can see the percent of increase of young people, young men, who have been sent to prison. So we know that one out of every four men of color and we're talking about the ages, and it used to be from like 17 to 25, and that age range has dropped lower than that, from 15 to 25, will find himself incarcerated. What a waste. What a waste. And what a tremendous job we have as Baha'is to create a different kind of environment for them. What we emphasize about the belonging is that teachers have to show up. Educators have to show up in a very special way. And we call it the stance that teachers or educators have to take. 
Stance is how I walk in the world. Most often when we do workshops, initially, teachers or educators want strategies. They want to know what the next lesson plan is so that they can go back and implement it the next day. But what we focus on, what we emphasize most critical for making this change is that they have to have a particular stance. They have to show up in a way that young people will see them as authentic. If, and I've already mentioned this, if they say one thing and they do another, what do you think the young people will hone in on? What they do, right, what they do. So we are focused all of the time on having people to, first of all, peel the onion, to be able to look inside to see how they have been socialized or indoctrinated to feel certain ways about people of color. And often the, the educators don't know that. You know, so we, we keep peppering our uh, workshop ling language with the fact that no one had control over his or her parents. This is not about guilt, blame, or shame, but it is about the responsibility that you have. If you're going to say you're an educator and that you are going to work with young people, then you have to show up in a certain way. And so we delve into how we all came to this particular place of being socialized in a certain way about who we are. And what we do and offer as a graphic for this is what we call the cycle of socialization or the cycle of oppression. I want you to imagine a young baby coming into the room, uh, crawling and, and just being uh, a baby that's exploring and inquisitive. So when you think of babies, and this is a shout out, this is a call and response, what are the kinds of attributes that you would associate with that baby? Joy, curious, open, innocent, vulnerable, fearless. What was that? Happy, happy, crying. Okay, um, and a friend of mine would say cha-ching, you know, money that, <laughs> that comes along with that as well. But as this baby comes into the room, and I'm just going to call the baby, Baby Billy. All right, so as Baby Billy enters the room and she's crawling around and she, uh, she wants to be nurtured and held, she goes to any number of people here and you are accommodating you share with her your, your good thoughts about her, you nurture her, you bounce her, you do everything that you need to do. But at no time did baby Billy distinguish race or sex or class. All that she wanted to do was to be held and nurtured, taken care of. But what happens as baby Billy grows, and I'm going to tell you my story as an African-American woman, that... In my early years, I learned misinformation about who I was. There was biased history about who I was. There were stereotypes out there about who I was. Perhaps now those stereotypes are not so ingrained, but I'm not so sure about that. But let's just say, baby Billy, some... Um, well, quite a few years ago. <laughs> Living for me at that time in an all African American community and attending an all African American school and it was a community in which my teachers lived. So I had tremendous support for me reaching my potentiality and my capacity. My teachers encouraged me. They shared with me the fact that I could achieve whatever I wanted to achieve. They model what Teresa Perry says in the book, Young, Gifted, and Black, that for us at that time, it was freedom for literacy and literacy for freedom. So I had this encouragement. I also got what we call another narrative, and this is what we are exploring for ourselves, the narratives that we were internalized with and we were socialized with, the other part of that narrative was I had to work twice as hard 
to be able to accomplish what my white counterparts accomplished. Now, I don't know how many brothers and sisters of color I have out there, but if there is uh, an amen there or you heard the same story, uh, you can just acknowledge by raising your hands. All right, all right. This was something that we heard, and so what it did, and I am not discounting um, the benefits from it, but you know, we were super overachievers. You know, we worked 150 percent, as opposed to our white brothers and sisters who maybe worked, they might have worked 150 percent. I'm not saying that they didn't, but it felt like we always were struggling in order to keep up. And that was because society had said to us that we were maybe not quite capable enough, not quite brilliant enough, not able to lead or lead well. Those were the messages that we got as we were growing up. And you know what, family? Those are the messages that young children of color still get today. They still get those messages. And unless we are able to somehow refute that information about who they are, they're going to continue getting those messages. Now, would that I had been able to stop it right there at the, that bubble because my family worked diligently to see that I got different messages. Unfortunately, though, those mass messages were reinforced and installed through these other institutions. They were enforced by media, and one of our partners is a um, professor at one of the major universities in St. Louis, Webster University, and he has a class, actually there are about four or five sections of this class, on race and media. That's just how popular the class is and what a problem media presents for young people who are trying to get an authentic look about who they are or an, or an authentic image of who they are. So you just think about what media does and how it perpetrates negativity. Government, if you think about what happens in government, you know, there, there are not a lot of people who look like me. Now, we, we do have a black biracial president, right, in office. And I think some people felt that when that happened, that racism was done, over. Okay. And what we have seen is that there really is an escalation of it. Yeah. People who perhaps might not have said anything about it before are now coming out and being very blatant in their actions. Houses of worship, well, we can exclude that, you know. Now remember, I'm, I'm not talking to a Baha'i audience when I'm with the educators. So houses of worship do show up as a place where the division is continued. And it's been said that one of the most segregated hours of the week is Sunday morning, when people go to their respective houses of worship. Fortunately, we don't have that separation. We don't have those divisions. Economics and class. Now this is a tricky one because we can think ourselves very liberal until we get to that place where we start dividing and counting material possessions and who has this and who doesn't have this. And sometimes we don't know we're operating out of that classism but we do, and we, we rank other people based on their material possessions. And finally, education. And this, for me, is the most critical place because this is where we get a chance to work with educators who will work with young people. And we often say to them that children are like wet cement. What falls on them sticks. And so we have to be very, very careful about what they do of what they say to young people. Take a few minutes. My 12-minute clock went off, and I try not to talk longer than 12 minutes before I know the, the blood will pool in the seat there. So <laughs> take a few minutes and talk to the person that you're seated next to and talk about the teacher that stands out most for you in your mind. Which teacher, 
Who was she? Who was he that had an influence on you? So talk among yourselves. Have some dialogue. Go back in time to the teacher who made an influence or had an influence on you. Finish your thought. <clears throat> Complete your statement and time. Finish your thought. Complete your statement and time. So talk to me a little bit. What came up for you, and I know it'll be difficult because you don't have the mic, but you did quite well when I asked you about babies. So <clears throat> this is, is a shout out. All right, so what came to you when you thought about that teacher? What was it about that teacher that encouraged you or maybe discouraged you? I don't know. Hand back there. Expectations. Expectations. Absolutely. Public, Public, okay, so, right. So this was not a good experience for you. Right. Public embarrassment. Love of God. Love of, love of God. All right. All right. I didn't hear that. Compassion. Confidence. Confidence. Prejudice. Prejudice. All right. So that was not a good experience for you. Right. But you see how those experiences stand out and stick with us? Yeah, if they made that difference in how we feel about ourselves. Saw some other, heard some other voices. Respectful. Respectful. And back there? Sincere. Sincere. Worldly. Worldly. All right. She liked me. Wow. That, that speaks volumes. <laughs> Expanded horizons. Right. Nobility. Nobility. Caring, caring, okay, all right. All discouragement, okay, all right. Tyranny, okay, all right, all right. You know, I, I'd like to think of myself as a teacher that encompassed those wonderful qualities um, that I was able to project to students about who they were, but I can remember sometimes I had to dance around a little bit, and as I peeled that onion to figure out why it is that I had this student in a particular place that left him or her no other out than to rebel, I, I think it went back to my ego. You know, teachers have this sense sometimes of power, and uh, being totally in charge and setting parameters for young people that are very constrictive. And I can remember that I had the choice when I had that student, in a sense, backed in the corner. I had the choice of further embarrassing him or apologizing to him. And which one do you think I did? Apologize. Apologize. Because I knew I had set up a situation that was a, a lose-lose situation for both of us. And what I had momentarily forgot was that young person's dignity. And so you should have seen me scrambling to recall that, to move back into that frame of reference that would allow me to see this noble being. His actions didn't speak to that, but I was able to see beyond that, to see who he really was. And so, as a result of that, he lived up to my expectations. So what happens if the negative information is reinforced by society through all of these institutions? And certainly there are other, are other institutions up there as well. We could say the criminal justice system. And I don't really have time to go into that, but I would just advise many of you or invite you to get a book entitled The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, I think you will be shocked and saddened and maybe motivated to do something about what is happening in a very systemic way. 
I did not at the beginning say that my partners and I and the information that we share with the people that we work with around race and racism is one in which we all believe that there is only one race. And we put that premise up right away, that there is only one race. But we also know that the architecture of racism was deliberately engineered to keep people separate, to keep people in a place where they're targeted and to keep other people in a place of power. So what happens then, and this brings me to this circle, we collude. If I hear over and over and over again that I'm not quite brilliant enough, I'm not quite capable enough, I can't lead, I should doubt my thinking, that this is who I am, I'm a person who's coming from a deficit place, then I am going to start believing it. I may not accept it wholeheartedly, but there are going to be places in my thinking that will cause me to doubt myself. I, I can't believe you the joy that I felt when I went to my first fireside and uh, the woman who conducted the fireside, Sissy Weil, she was married to Henry Weil and I had the, the bounty to be with them often. Talked about the efflorescence and the effervescence of African-American people. Had never heard anything like that before. Didn't know anything about the pupil of the eye. This was 35 years ago. I was a result of the 1974 conference in St. Louis, the International Conference. Well, I became a Baha'i after that. After attending, well, actually not attending, after seeing the information on TV. And then I looked for the firesides. I wanted to know where they were. And I had already read that Ebony article. Uh, and see, this really dates me. <laughs> okay? So I was searching, and I knew that there was something more than my particular church was offering me, although I am no way disparaging the kind of spiritual information I got as a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. So that it was a strong foundation for me, but I also knew that there was something else. And lo and behold, Baha'u'llah came to me. So, given the misinformation about who we are and there's no way to refute it, nothing that would say that, no, uh -uh, that, that's not true about you, you are this noble being, then we collude. And we collude in ways for people of color, we call it the internalized racism. Anytime you systematically oppress a group of people, that group will internalize the oppression and pass it on to themselves and others who look like them. And sometimes we don't even know we're doing it. We say, that's just the way I am. We also mention over and over again that we did not set that up, so it's not our fault. When we operate out of that, it's not our fault, but it becomes our responsibility to do something about it, to educate ourselves in such a way that we see we are not living up to that vast potential and capacity that Baha'u'llah has put out there in front of us. And while I might not say Baha'u'llah, I do allow them or I do invite them to see their nobility and how they have been succumbing to misinformation about who they are. And that is not their authentic self. If we don't stop the cycle, it repeats. If we do stop the cycle, we probably are going to work with the feelings that are up there. There will be some anger, and we certainly have experienced that among our participants, but we have ground rules in which we can handle that, and we allow people to feel the feelings. And we don't get confused about their goodness. Sometimes when people see uh, passionate feelings. There is some confusion around associating that person with the passion or with the anger. And we don't get confused about that. We know the goodness of the person and we acknowledge the feelings that are there. There are feelings sometimes of resentment, denial, confusion, aggression, isolation. That's okay. 
It keeps people in the dialogue. If we create a safe environment for those feelings to be explored, and we have been able to do that, I think in a very competent way, because when people leave, they are yearning to re-engage with the people they have participated with. They create what we call ally groups so that they can continue the dialogue because people are dying to talk about race and racism. I cannot overemphasize how much people want to get together to share their stories. And we, and I'm sure there are other organizations as well, are offering a venue for people to be able to just come together and talk. And when that happens, we create what's called the path of liberation. This is one of the ways that we have found to be very effective in working with educators is for them to get a glimpse of how they have been socialized in ways to think less about people who look different from them. Often what happens is those individuals get very angry and they wonder how they were duped into thinking certain things about other people. And so there's a little bit of the grieving process for them because it was significant others who shared with them that maybe people of color weren't quite brilliant enough, weren't, weren't capable enough, weren't able to do certain things. But once again, we also offer the corollary that people perform or they act in ways that they have been indoctrinated and that these young people who were in front of us at the workshop, they have an opportunity to break the cycle. And what we do is, and I know my time is moving rapidly here, is we ask them to get into groups and just for maybe about five minutes, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. This is not... Um, an exhaustive list of social groups, but these are the ones that we put up in front of them, and we put these groups in front of them because of the No Child Left Behind Act. Anybody familiar with Nickleby or No Child Left Behind? All right, okay, so you know exactly why we put these particular groups in front of them, because these are the groups of people that they will work with. These are the groups of children that they will work with. And so we want them to explore maybe the subconscious ideas about what they think about these young people. And we put it up in four categories, family and friend, media, faith-based, and school. So I'm gonna ask you for the next five minutes, just explore messages that you got about one or two of the groups. You won't have time to do all of them, but pick a group and explore the messages that you got as a child. Now I want you to go back in time, and I'm sure for most of you it won't be far back, but I want you to be in middle school. And I want you to think about the messages that you got about any of those groups there from those four divisions there. So talk among yourselves for a few minutes. Using the chart up there. Finish your thought. <laughs> Complete your statement. And time. Once again, just a reminder that you're doing in 50 minutes what we do in two days. And of course, there are a number of other components that we have in our two-day retreat. I want to end with, once again, what Teresa Perry says that is needed in schools and that she suggests that we need in schools or what we need in schools is a counter-narrative. And that's what we as members of educational equity consultants hope that we are providing for teachers a way that they can see themselves differently and a way that they can see their students in a different way. One that confronts the messages surrounding our young people about their intellect 
and capacity for learning. She addresses in her first essay in that book the mythology about the intellectual prowess of young African-American children. She addresses that myth of the inferiority of the intellectual ability of young people. And it is a prevailing myth that finds its way into some concrete action, actions on the part of educators. Not all, but certainly on many of them. And it's not until we bring it into their arena of awareness that they realize that they have lower expectations for young people of color. The Ubuntu philosophy that we share with them, and once again, couldn't think of a better way to term that or to, to describe that other than transforming habits of thought, is that teachers and educators create a safe environment, an environment where young people are valued, where they have some personal power, and above all, I think this is sort of the linchpin for me because I can remember making mistakes and my dignity was at risk, where they can make mistakes and not risk their dignity, and that they know that they are growing and learning. If the human race is one, any notion that a particular racial, ethnic, or national group is in some way superior to the rest of humanity must be dismissed. Society must reorganize its life to give practical expression to the principle of equality for all its members, regardless of race, regardless of color, creed, or gender. And all individuals must be given the opportunity to realize their inherent potential and thereby contribute to an ever advancing civilization. And so as I end, I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes and to do some visioning. And I'm going to read this last quote and it is that prompt that I want you to just think about what you can do, how you can create how you can continue to create a place where Baha'u'llah says to us, ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. Deal ye one with another with the utmost love and harmony, with friendliness and fellowship. Thank you, dear family. Thank you.